Here's your host, Alex Garrett. Well, I want to thank Podmatch for making this connection because through Podmatch, I've gotten to meet a lot of great people and now including Ken Kunkin. And Ken, your story is across all lines, sports, adaptability, and having one leg up on life because um, you did play sports and that's kind of where your adaptability story started. But most importantly now, you are on the board of directors of my alma mater, the Viscardi Center. I'm very honored to have you on today. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And why this drew me in is because you have done exactly what Dr. Viscardi started, you know, out in Albertson, which is be that vocational counselor, be a, a guide to people with disabilities to get them back out there after um, they, they've had to adapt to, to life. And I want to I want to say, first of all, what's it like being on the board of directors? Thank you so much for supporting Viscardi. Uh, it's great to stay involved with Viscardi. You know, Dr. Viscardi gave me my start. When nobody would hire me, Dr. Viscardi hired me to work for Abilities Incorporated, which was one of the corporations of the Viscardi Center. And he hired me to work as a vocational rehabilitation counselor there. And I absolutely loved the place, loved the work, loved Dr. Viscardi. And as a result of me working there, I developed the self-confidence to decide that there was still more that I could do. And I decided to go to law school. So I left the center, applied to Hofstra University Law School. Dr. Biscardi himself wrote a personal letter of recommendation for me. And it's just been great to be involved with Dr. Biscardi in the center. I work for Ability. And is that his book behind you, by the way? I'm noticing that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's my book. I, I wrote a book recently called I Dream of Things That Never Were the Ken Kunkin story. It's available on Amazon. It's been out for almost a year now. And I talk about my time at Abilities and the Viscardi Center while I'm there. So I worked for Abilities Inc. Uh, at the Viscardi Center for over two years, went to law school. And 30 years after I left the center, the president of Abilities Inc. called me on the telephone and asked me to be a member of their board of directors. So starting in 2009, I've been a member of first the Abilities Inc. board of directors, and then beginning in 2017, a member of the Viscardi Center's board of directors. So I'm so pleased and proud to stay involved with the center. Tell me about bringing uh, disability advocacy into the DA role as, in NASA's DA assistant DA role. Talk about that as well. Well, it was interesting. You know, when I started in the DA's office, firstly, they never had a quadriplegic working there before, and certainly not as a trial attorney. And when I started there, I went through, you know, first three years of law school, graduated from Hofstra Law School, passed the difficult New York State Bar exam, began my work at the DA's office by going through a four-week intensive training program where they taught us all aspects of trial techniques from a prosecutor's perspective. I went to court my first day and I couldn't fit through the swinging doorways in the courtroom. They were too narrow to allow me to get through in my electric wheelchair. So advocacy obviously never ended in terms of trying to make the courts and the court system more accessible. Because that was the situation in every courtroom I encountered. The swinging doorways were too narrow to allow me to get through to the prosecutor's table. Wow. And so how did that change? They, did you find they were able to adapt, you know, for your needs to, to do your job right? They really tried to help me in any way that they could. And, and I found them to be very supportive. And and Dennis Dillon, who was the district attorney at the time, was a very progressive, forward-thinking, self-confident district attorney who really did his best to make things more accessible for me and to give me the opportunity to show what I could do. And I, and I will always appreciate his help and support for that. 
Ken, I want to ask you about your, you know, how this all started because you were a football player. And did you enjoy your time playing the game? Let me get this right here. You were a football player at Cornell and you actually broke your neck in 1970. Up until that point, uh, how fun was it to play college football? And did you stay in touch? I know you actually went went back to Cornell to get your undergraduate, but did you stay in touch with the athletics department even after your injury? Absolutely. I got hurt at the beginning of my junior year in college. I was playing on Cornell's lightweight football team. At the time, they called it the 150-pound team. Now it's called sprint football. And I broke my neck making a tackle on a kickoff in a game against Columbia University. And as a result, I'm a quadriplegic, almost totally paralyzed below my shoulders. I found my coaches and teammates at Cornell were very supportive, encouraging, uh, visited me a lot when I was in the hospital, even started a fund for me to help pay for some of my expenses. And they, they've been absolutely great and continue to be great. I've, I've stayed in touch with uh, the original coach, um, unfortunately has since passed away, but his son was also one of the coaches at the time. And I've stayed in touch with him. Uh, but I was fortunate when I got out of the hospital to go back to Cornell and earn my undergraduate degree in industrial engineering. And as a result, I'm the first quadriplegic to ever graduate from Cornell. Congratulations um, on that. That's you. a huge, that's a huge deal. And do you find that your experience has kind of made even Cornell more accessible for students today? You know, it's great. I, you know, when I was up there, I convinced them to put in a couple of, I wouldn't call them curb cuts then. They were like little ramps to get up curbs. And I even convinced them to put in a ramp to my dorm room, which had 10 steps to get to my dorm. So they started making some modifications when I was up there. But certainly as a result of the Americans with Disabilities Act, they've made tremendous strides now in making the campus accessible. I've been up there recently, and I'm going up there again in a few weeks. And it's incredible to see the changes in that school. You know, I got to ask you, because you you were also on the criminal trial <laughs> attorney side of things as well. So did getting into law was, you know, expanding the rights of the disabled? I, I, I don't like to really talk about, you know, focus on the disability, but going into law, did that, was that a focus for you? You know, that was one of the focuses. When I was working at the Biscardi Center, one of the things that I did was I spoke before groups and organizations on the topics of affirmative action and non-discrimination for people with disabilities. And often after my talks, I'd be asked questions. And while I'd certainly do my best to answer those questions, I was always careful to caution the questioners that they should really consult with a lawyer about their concerns. And I guess it didn't take long before I started to think, you know, there's no reason why I couldn't become that lawyer. So that was one of my aims when I went to law school. But while I was in law school, I also had an older brother who was two years older than me, who was working as a trial attorney at the time for the Legal Aid Society. And I got to watch him in court a number of times. And I did an internship at the district attorney's office and absolutely fell in love with the, the office and trial work in general. So that convinced me that what I really wanted to do was to be in the courtroom and the opportunity to be in the courtroom almost on a daily basis by working at the district attorney's office was really exciting for me. And I really appreciated the opportunity okay. to work there. I got to ask you this because obviously whenever someone with disability is in the workforce, people tend to think of that first. So how were you able to say, break the ice and, ice and say, you know what, I have a brain, I'm not just in this chair, but I have a brain and I have a lot of thoughts. In other words, how did you make sure to let your legal prowess um, over, how did I say it, but define you and not the disability, if you will? You know, that's an interesting question. Right before my first trial, my bureau chief uh, asked me to uh, come to his office and discuss this. 
And he specifically asked me, how am I going to handle my disability in front of the jury? And the question kind of took me by surprise because my response was, I wasn't planning on mentioning it at all. My feeling was once the jury saw me in the courtroom and saw how I functioned, they were not going to base their verdict on my inability to walk. They were going to base it on my competence and skill as an attorney. And I can tell from speaking to jurors after my trials that I was correct. Once I started talking, they told me they completely forgot about the fact that I was in a wheelchair and treated me just like they would treat any other attorney. And, and I might add that after I started doing trials in our district court bureau, I was approached by a defense attorney who told me he overheard some of the prisoners talking about me in the pens behind the courtroom. And one of the things they were saying was that I was a really tough assistant district attorney, and they hoped they didn't get the guy in the wheelchair as their prosecutor. I guess in a way that's a compliment, right? It so sure that's... was. It sure was, and that's how I took it. All right. Well, um, let me ask you this. Uh, by the way, I, I work with Arthur Idali. He's a criminal defense attorney here in New York City, so I get, I'm kind of in the legal world through that, through the radio world. Um, but talk about your book. I, I, I want to know more about what's in the book and what people can expect when they buy it. Great. Well, I wrote the book, I Dream of Things That Never Were, the Ken Kunkin story, based on my life. And I might add that the way I got the title for this book was while I was still in the rehab center at the Rusk Institute in New York City, I was asked to testify before a United States Senate subcommittee on health care chaired by Senator Edward Kennedy. And eight days after my testimony, Senator Kennedy sent me a glass paperweight in the mail that had an inscription on it that the senator said his late brother Robert Kennedy liked very much. And the words in that inscription have always been so meaningful to me. You know, the inscription was a quotation that read, some men see things as they are and say why. I dream of things that never were and say why not. That's why I got the title of my book, I Dream of Things That Never Were. And I discuss in the book my life and particularly what happened in my accident and what it was like going through rehabilitation in the hospital and how I was treated by the doctors, the staff, the medical profession in general. Once I had a physical disability, for some reason, they tried to seem to treat me as if I was totally disabled and that I couldn't think for myself. And while I was there, it seemed like the best they thought I would ever do would be to sell magazine subscriptions over the telephone. And I was convinced there was a lot more I could do than that. So when I left there, I went on back to Cornell, completed my undergraduate degree, then got a master's degree at Cornell in counseling and student personnel administration, a master's degree at Columbia in psychological counseling and rehabilitation, and started looking for a job. And I write about this in my book, What That Was Like. Here I had three Ivy League degrees, two master's degrees, and no one would hire me. It seemed everyone felt I was still too disabled to work. And I was very fortunate to come in contact with Dr. Henry Viscardi Jr. in Albertson, Long Island, and he offered me my first full-time job. And thanks amazing. to that. Amazing, I, this, is, this is amazing. I, I love this story, Ken. Thank you. Well, I loved working there. I loved the work. I loved the people. And it was a really tough decision to leave. But, you know, being there really gave me the confidence and that those feelings of self-esteem were increased. My self-worth was increased. And I felt, you know, there's still more I could do. So I went to law school, uh, thrilled to get my dream job as an assistant district attorney, and absolutely thrilled to be contacted by the Viscardi Center to be on their board of directors and stay involved with the center. Well, I don't know if you remember, but Ted Kennedy Jr. actually was there at Viscardi a while back. Obviously, he has a prosthetic now, but he was 
he's been part of the sports night festivities. And, you know, you look at sports night and all these athletes come through to support this. What does that mean to you as a board member? Well, one, it means a lot. But two, let me say I was there when Ted Kennedy's son was there. I got to meet him and speak with him and tell him about my involvement with his father, which I really uh, enjoyed doing. But it means a lot to be involved with this dinner because not only did they gave me did they give me my start, they've helped so many other people along the way. And it's taught me so much. And in fact, I got my family involved with the center as well. And now the current chairman of the board of directors at the center is Roy Danis, my cousin. Roy visited the Scotty Center when I was working there, took a strong interest in the center, and is now chairman of the board of directors there. I got to ask you this, as an alumnus, as a, as a Viscardi kid, basically, from kindergarten to 12th grade, um, when you see the students of Viscardi, what does that mean to you, uh, Ken Kunkin? It, well, in a lot of ways, I see myself. It means a lot. I've had the opportunity to speak at one of the Viscardi graduations. Uh, I've spoken to students on other occasions, as well as I've spoken to individuals who went through some of the Viscardi training programs. It means a tremendous amount because I can see the desire, the motivation in the, the kids and the adults as well who are there to make something of their lives. They just want the opportunity to show what they could do, just as I did. And if I could help pave the way for them by showing there's so much you can do with a disability and that everybody needs to keep their expectations high for what somebody can do and accomplish. It makes a tremendous difference in everybody's lives, not just the, the people themselves, but the people they come in contact with. And I would just like to add that um, when you work at the district attorney's office, they have a process that when people leave the office, they go through an exit interview. And in that exit interview, they discuss what they felt were the best parts of the job and the parts of the job they liked the least. And I was told a number of times that a number of the people when they left said the best part of their job was meeting me, getting to know me and working with me. And I say that not to boast or to brag because I know they weren't talking about meeting Ken Kunkin. They were talking about meeting and getting to know and working with somebody with a severe disability. And to them, it was a new experience for many of them. And I think firstly, they appreciated the fact that it didn't mean additional work for them, that they were certainly gratified about, but also they seemed impressed by my attitude, my hard work, my determination, and it motivated them to do more in the job and in their lives. And I appreciate that. And I think more people when they come in contact with people with disabilities, realize that and come away with the same reaction. Ken, uh, this this is so powerful. Your your first experience, though, after this neck injury, did you have surgery? And if so, what was that like? Because this is 1970 surgery. This is a 2024 surgery. So talk about what the adapt adaptation process was like in the 70s to becoming disabled. Well, I did have surgery nine days after I was hurt. And when I was in the hospital, the medical profession, for some reason, seemed to feel the less I knew, the better. So they didn't tell me a lot about what was going on. I knew that I had broken my neck and the surgery was to fix the break in my neck. I didn't know anything about a spinal cord injury and that that was the reason for my paralysis. And, you know, it, it was very difficult to communicate with them and find out more. In fact, when my family met with a specialist about my condition, he told them I probably wouldn't survive the week, that if I did, I would have no movement, my life expectancy would be between five and nine years, and I'd probably end up living that time in a nursing home. The doctor actually suggested to my parents, if he were my son, I would just let him go. That was the attitude back then. Fortunately, it's changed a lot in the last 50 plus years. 
But that's what it was like back in 1970. All right. Well, as someone who's a sports fan still to this day, uh, the adaptive sports world has really taken off. I want to ask you, have you played sports in the adaptive sports world since the 70s? Have you been able to play? And also, do you ever check check out the wheelchair basketball program at Biscardi? You know, I've watched some of it and and I it's thrilling to, to watch what everybody can do. And I enjoy that. And uh, watching part of the Special Olympics actually was terrific. I'm still an avid sports fan. Uh, I'm addicted to watching every New York Jet game that's on television and reading about them and just cheering people on. Um, All right. So did you get to meet Joe Namath during your time at at Sports Night when he was there or what? Yeah, I met Joe Namath as well as a lot of other sports celebrities. And it's great. In fact, one of the first things that I did when I went back to Cornell was when I I went to a Cornell football game. So I'm still an avid spectator, an avid sports fan, uh, and it's great to see the modifications now that allow, allow so many people with disabilities to compete. It's just great. I know Viscardi has always been so active in promoting. Joe Salonica is the man. He's, he's like my mentor over there, Joe Salonica with the wheelchair program. And I, just he and Mike Sweeney encourage sports and, you know, for kids with disabilities, I always felt that sports was a great way to build character, much like anybody who was able-bodied. I mean, it just it's a great way to build character and, and helps give us an edge in a society that might view us a certain way, you know? You know, when I think of sports, I think it did so much for me because, for one, it taught me the importance of participating. I was never going to be content just sitting like on the sidelines watching other people do things and enjoy life. I wanted to be active and be a part of things and not just wait for things to come to me. But in addition, I think sports helped prepare me for the day that I'd be competing against people who were bigger, stronger, and faster than I was. And I think it helped give me the self-confidence to know that I could compete and match up against anybody or anything as long as I worked hard, tried my best, continued to improve, and wasn't afraid to take chances or make difficult choices. Ken, got to ask you this. Um, Dr. Viscardi has been a huge mentor to you, obviously. So tell me about the biggest message or biggest thing that he taught you in your time with him. He brought you up basically into the abilities world. So tell me about his mentorship, if you will. Like, what well, the biggest thing you learned from him? Well... You know, when I first met Dr. Biscardi, I was amazed at seeing so many people with disabilities in the workforce doing productive jobs and not just entry level positions, but positions of responsibility. I hadn't seen that before I met Dr. Biscardi and visited the center. And Dr. Biscardi told me that he had high expectations for me when he saw what I was doing. And, you know, what I had achieved through my education. And he helped give me the encouragement, you know, to know that there was a lot I could still do. And showed me by example, one, to observe him and how he was leading his life. But two, all the other workers at the center and the students going there, you know, not only were they leading active lives, but just seeing the expressions on everybody's faces. It was such an upbeat place, you know, with people just filled with joy and happiness at the opportunity to be themselves and show everybody what they can do. Well, this has been so special and we can talk for hours. I want to have you back on for another conversation. But before I go, um, obviously, you're in the power chair today. When was your first power chair and what was that experience like to get that first chair? You know, my first chair was while I was in Rusk undergoing through the rehab. And the chairs were not as well designed as they are now, which is, you know, quite a difference. And it was great to be able to move from one place to another by myself without needing the assistance of attendants. But I might add that as soon as I left the center, I went up to Cornell. I wasn't able to use my power chair at all. Because every the whole campus is on steep hills, and there were steps in front of every building. And when I first went up there, there was not one ramp or curb cut 
on the entire campus. So it was actually years after I got out of the rehab center until I was working at the Viscardi Center that I really had the opportunity to use my power wheelchair. And it made a tremendous difference, that feeling of independence. And, and Dr. Chris Rosa today, Viscardi is doing a heck of a job leading the, the team. I'm sure you, you interact with him on a daily basis or at least monthly, weekly basis, right? Right. I just saw uh, Chris last week and I'll be seeing him again. Uh, at the golf I, outing Monday. That's right. Yeah. The golf outing Monday. I should promote that here on the right. show. That's right. That's right. And I'll be seeing him again uh, at the end of September on two different occasions. And as I indicated, it's now my cousin Roy Danis is the chairman of the board of directors there. And he works closely with Chris. I got to say, I'm going to shoot the, drop the link to the uh, golf outing. If people want to join and see what Viscardi is about. Um, I highly recommend going to that golf outing. I loved the golf outing a couple of years ago. It was, it was great. And what Viscardi, Dr. Viscardi has done for my class and so many people. And of course, what he did for World War II veterans when they first came back. I mean, that's where it all started. So Absolutely. And in fact, it was my cousin, Roy Danis, who started the tradition of having golf outings. That was Roy's work. But yeah. What's it mean to con continue that legacy of Viscardi and also um, continue the advocacy um, years later after your first, you know, after you became disabled and had to adapt, what does it mean to you to continue the legacy and continue advocacy? What, what does it mean for you? It makes me very proud. I'm very proud now to go out in public and show my face, show people what I've done, but to go back to the Viscardi Center and show them, look, you know, this is the education the treatment, the encouragement Viscardi gave me, right? And that I know he's given to all of you, even though Viscardi unfortunately has passed on. Uh, the legacy that he has left has helped thousands of people along the way. And by helping thousands, I'm, I'm talking about not just the people that went through the Viscardi school training programs, placement programs, but the people they've come in contact with since then. It has made a difference in so many lives. And he should be recognized as one of the real icons of American history and what he's done for people and everybody's civil rights. It's incredible. And he was, I always say, the godfather of the ADA because he was very involved in making that happen. Um, Absolutely. Ken, do you drive? And I, I wanted to shout out Anna, who is your, your beloved, and she's always by your side. And She's gotten you through this. I want to shout out Anna today as well, because she helped me coordinate this. So thanks to Anna. And, and I'm sure having her by your side means a lot as well. It, it means a tremendous amount. And she's by my side today. She's just slightly off camera to my right. Anna, you want to just duck your head in for a minute well, and say hi. Move, move closer to the mic. There's Anna. There she is. Hey, Anna. Thanks hi. so much for... Yeah. for and for Alex, as you mentioned, she's by my side you know, all the time. And Anna is my wife. We've been married now for 22 years, 21 years, 21 years, going on 22 years. Uh, and I might add, our family has grown since we got married. We're the proud parents of triplet sons. We have three boys. They're each 19 years old, going to college now. They're all sophomores. Uh, one's at SUNY Morrisville, one's at Syracuse, and one's at, uh, at my alma mater, Cornell. That's got to be so cool to see them all off and thriving, and 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 that's that's special. And, of course, your son at Cornell as well, continuing that legacy there. Um, Ken, this has been so special. We're going to have you back on um, in the near months and talk about more about uh, your experiences, maybe Viscardi and other stuff. I'm sure you got a lot of stories to share. And, where can I find the book? Amazon? I'm going to promote that link. It's on well. Amazon. It's also on uh, Caroline Academic Press. But if you uh, go to my website, which is kenkunkin.com, it has a box to show where everybody can buy the book as well. Well, I'm going to share that link. I'll share your page as well. And thanks for joining me today on the One Thank Leg you. Up Network. Great. Thank you. It's good to be here.